Welcome to Russian History with Dr. Bravkin. Today I'd like to discuss the Putin interview to Tucker Carlson. The whole world is talking about it and there are so many reactions and so many misunderstandings that I think I see my purpose today is to say, to explain what was said, what was not said, and what was meant. Perhaps the most important thing to start with is that Tucker Carlson, although a sympathetic interviewer, and Putin talked to each other in two different incompatible ways. Tucker Carlson was interested in posing sharp questions as, a, as an interviewer, as a person who wants to reveal something to capture the attention of his audience. Putin was in a totally different mood. and He was in the mood to discuss philosophy, history, identity, soul, and he kept trying to persuade Tucker Carlson to come back to these topics and, and have a, what he called a serious conversation. Uh, and then Tucker would always come back and, and ask provocative contemporary questions of policy. And this is one of the most important things that that most people seems to have totally missed. The reaction of Western media and political uh, figures shows that. They, they dismiss what Putin said completely. They're not interested. The sharpest reaction was from the European Union, who actually said that Tucker Carlson should be fined and that Musk should be fined and that X, uh, the Twitter platform, should be fined for just for uh, uh, letting Putin interview on the air. Now, that's the degree of the freedom of speech that Europe has come to. Uh, it is also very interesting to see that, that uh, it, they interpret Putin's speech as hate speech and therefore on that basis the law should be applied that bans Putin from speech. Now, as far as I can see, nobody would in his right mind would call it a hate speech. There was nothing of the sort. There were all kinds of proposals for uh, resolution of the war and all that stuff. But uh, uh, Netanyahu is not hate speech, who refuses to, 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 cease, to do the ceasefire and continues the war. And Putin offering the proposal of peace negotiations is hate speech. That shows the degree of absurdity of Western policies to Russia right now. But aside from that, even serious uh, interpreters like uh, Fiona Hill, for example, completely dismisses the historical part. And most Western observers dismiss it as lies, as propaganda, as factually not accurate. That's, they miss the point completely. Uh, whether people like it or not, Putin is the president of Russia and the way he thinks and the way he perceives history is extremely important simply because he is the president of a big country, a powerful country, a superpower. And when you are try to at least understand, not accept, but understand what he's trying to say about Russian history and why this is important. One could get it getting closer to the solution, uh, but the Western response was total denial. We, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to understand it. Some on Fox people said, uh, news people said this is boring, the history lecture was boring and not interesting and so forth. So let me just briefly explain why this is important. It is important because uh, the history of Ukraine and Russian relations for is, is, is the topic that today determines the future of the world because this war can easily escalate to a nuclear war and that's why it's important to understand what people are fighting for. The Ukrainian side is, is, is well known and this is the one that the West has adopted as its own, which is that there's a Russian aggression as against an independent state. Now the point of course Putin has been trying to say Ukraine is not like any other state. It is not like Poland or like Germany or like Finland that used to be uh, associated like Poland and the Russian Empire, but Poland is a different nation. What Putin was trying to say, Ukraine is not a different nation. And, it, and this is why he goes all the way back to the 8th century. Uh, Fiona Hill said, well, in Britain 2000 years ago was a Roman Empire. But what Fiona doesn't understand is that the Romans are not British and the British never thought of themselves as Romans. Whereas Ukrainian uh, origin, there was no Ukraine before 1500s. The origin is one nation. These are the Kiev and Rus. So it's not just a foreign country. This is a country that 
has its very origin is the same people who divided into two parts like two brothers and the only difference between them was the dialect and by that comparison all the germanic dialects are the same uh, the, the diverse and one would not understand Swabian if you were in prussia uh, or bavarian but nevertheless they all coalesced into one german nation so from that point of view ukrainian dialect and ukrainian western um, culture of western ukraine is still part of the same Kievan Rus Moscow Rus tradition. That's what he was trying to say. He gave a, a bunch of documents in a file that everybody ignored that showed that Bohdan Khmelnytsky, the leader of the <coughs> Orthodox people, who defined themselves as Orthodox as opposed to Catholic, uh, and and this was at the edges of the Polish empire and the people at the edge is the origin of the word ukraine at the edge people at the edge they were orthodox and they rebelled against catholics and this was the most important identification there was no uh, ethnic component to the word ukraine there was at the edge component geographic component to the people who were orthodox which meant russian uh, because this was one and the same thing. Orthodox means Russian, Orthodox means Ukrainian in a sense that it's a part of territory. Okay, so uh, that's, that's what Putin was trying to communicate. Now further down the road, fast forwarding, it's 400 years of the same history. Now, can you imagine Catalonia wants independence, but the Spanish say, no, we are, we've been together for hundreds of years. We cannot let you go. Well, it's the same thing here. Uh, Ukrainians do develop, did develop a separate identity, but that does not mean that that separate identity necessarily implies separate statehood, including membership in NATO. So Putin was trying to explain very well that uh, there was a separate identity that developed partly the, under the influence of Austria-Hungary and the Western identity of Western Ukrainians. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Putin said we were getting along just fine uh, until there was a coup at the, the in the 2014, which led to a conflict with Crimea and then to the Donbass and then to the current thing. So uh, that's the most important thing about his historical vision. It is the, to, to explain Russian perception, which the West doesn't f uh, accept, that's fine, but uh, a Russian perception of Ukraine as one part of Russia. Okay, now the next point I want to say is what exactly his, did he propose anything specific and how to interpret this? I look at this like this. The message that Putin gave is, number one, Russia is ready to negotiate. Zelensky does not want to negotiate. Uh, calling Biden is useless because Biden is not going to do anything. And even if he could, he wouldn't because he is constrained by the establishment. Uh, to win over Russia is impossible. So this is what he's in his own words and in the opinion of many other observers. Uh, to stand to stop the war, the U.S. has to stop the aid, the military supply of aid, and therefore it would stop on some kind of negotiating uh, negotiations. Denazification. Carlson kept asking him, "What about denazification? What do you mean?" And, and there he didn't give a clear answer. He basically said to stop the supporters of Bandera uh, and, and these neo-Nazis that are still uh, quite powerful in Ukraine. But he didn't actually mean, he didn't, exp there was a contradiction. On the one hand, he wants to negotiate with Zelensky. At the end, at the same time, he says Zelensky's regime is neo-Nazi and there must be denazification, implying that there should not be a Zelensky regime. Then, then what comes next? Is there an implication here that the, that, that, that the regime change is in the offing? That is left unsaid and unclear. To whom is uh, 
Putin talking. There was a lot of difference of opinion on this score. Some people said this is for the Western public. Some of the observers said this is for Trump. Uh, my point to that is it's not for Trump because if it were for Trump there would be something concrete that Putin would be hinting at offering. There was nothing that he was offering, nothing at all. He's basically uh, confident that he is winning, that uh, the war would continue as long as it takes to win. Uh, and uh, there was absolutely no uh, give and take. Uh, NATO net membership is un unacceptable. So he c repeated the whole thing all over again that he said in December 2021 uh, without any uh, further compromise. Moreover, one could say that Putin's position actually toughened because at that time he didn't speak about all of Ukraine. Now he's saying Russian and Ukrainian people are one and they will be reconciled and reunited. Russian lands will be returned. Uh, Zelensky's regime is unacceptable. So it's actually a harder position than there was uh, in 2022 or at the negotiations in Istanbul. Uh, so for who is he talking? My feeling is that he's talking not to the Western leaders at all and not even to the Western publics, although he's trying to explain his position to the Western publics. My view is that he's talking to the third world. He's talking to BRICS governments and peoples. He's trying to show that Russia is strong, that Russia is winning, uh, that his expose of the GDP of BRICS versus the G7 shows that he, uh, the message is Russia is on the right side of history. The, 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 the global south is winning, is becoming greater and bigger. The dollar is being dumped. These are the historical processes, he says. So he's basically saying, I don't care about the West anymore. I don't trust them. I don't want to deal with them. I, I'm just going to do my job and finish this war on my conditions and let the world know that nobody can challenge Russia militarily. So from that point of view, he's kind of boasting that Russia is strong. Uh, he sounds very confident uh, and that he is going to lead it to uh, to conclusion. What's also new that came up here is his new thesis that never appeared before in his previous speeches is that this, is this, this topic of uh, the civil war. He gives example that there are Russians fighting on the Ukrainian side and it's two brothers who are fighting each other and they will become peace when the two brothers will um, will uh, reconcile. To, to, in a sense, confirm his uh, point about the Russians being on the other side is exactly the same day or the next day Zelensky fired uh, his ch chief of staff, Zaluzhny, and promoted Sirsky, who is Russian, ethnically is Russian. He of, uh, graduated from a military academy in Moscow. So this actually proves Putin's words. The commander-in-chief of the, Itali of the um, Ukrainian army is a Russian general. So uh, that, that's what uh, he knew. And, and the last thing that was new is this whole discussion that uh, Dr. Carlson threw at Putin about Hungarian minority in Western Ukraine uh, and what's going to happen to it. And he was very surprised that this issue came up. Uh, but he, uh, he said, well, if th these people want to reunite with Hungary, why not? But there's also a a small Polish minority, as far as I know, and there's also a small Romanian minority in Western Ukraine. And the entire, what's called Carpathian Rus, uh, or um, Carpathian Mountains, Western Ukraine, as it is called today, uh, used to be uh, a part of Poland before World War II. Uh, so all this leads all kinds of questions. What's going to happen to that territory? Where would the border with Russia and Ukraine will be? Uh, will, will Putin incorporate all of Ukraine or um, in addition to Kyiv, uh, Odessa and Kharkov as, as what he feels Russian lands? All these questions remain unanswered. But the only thing that one comes across, unfortunately, is that the West is not interested in listening to Putin and uh, not interested in his proposals. And, and one can end on s by saying that uh, Musk is right, uh, that uh, if the West doesn't want to deal with Putin, uh, the person who may replace him 
after his uh, retirement or in some other circumstances, may be a much, much tougher nationalist uh, who will not be as uh, willing to negotiate and to offer a deal as Putin seems to be still doing in his interview, although his position hardened. That's all I wanted to say for today. Thank you very much, and I see you soon with uh, another edition of uh, Russian History with Dr. Brovkin.